Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. Investors Bank. Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. NJIT. New Jersey Institute of Technology, Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, working for great public schools for every child. PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Promotional support provided by The Star Ledger, powering NJ.com, and by Commerce Magazine. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. (laughs) I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. I mean, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. We're pleased to welcome Luke Weiss and Melissa Ramatar. They're the winners of the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center Best Team Aimed Award, and they're doing this in cooperation with our friends at Investors Bank. Uh, Kevin Cummings told us about this program and uh, over at Investors. He said it was a great program where the best teammates are recognized. You, in fact, uh, your sport is football, mm-hmm. okay? And you played basketball as well? Yes, and baseball. And baseball, oh, excuse me. You gotta get them all in, right? <laughs> Three sport, man. And for you, Melissa, it was uh, volleyball and softball. Yes. And you were picked because they honored 37 athletes, and you're considered great teammates. Now I'm going to ask you, what do you think the characteristics of a great teammate really are? We could say someone was a great player, but that's not what this was. This is a great teammate. Go. Um, the the characteristics of having a great teammate is just. Being there for your team, you know, being sincere, honest, and having the ability to have your team trust you with anything. They could come to you and they could talk to you, you know, with anything. And the, being the best teammate award is just being there for your team, in my opinion. So I'll give you an example. I often think about this because our boys are, as we do this show, 9 and 11. One kid strikes out in a tough situation. They play uh, travel baseball. Our big boy plays travel baseball. I've seen a kid strike out, Luke, right? In a tough situation. I see some of the other kids get down on him. I'm like, are you mm-hmm. kidding me? That kid didn't want to strike out. That yeah. kid feels terrible. What's a good teammate supposed to do right now? He's supposed to pick him up, go tell him, you know, just want a bat, forget about it, and uh, there's the rest of the game out of him. Where'd you learn how to do that? Um, I learned it from captains ahead of me and probably my, my dad the most. He was always about about my dad. Yeah, how how did he teach that? He, you know, he was just always a positive person in my life, and was just, you know, if something happens, you know, you could forget about it if it's good or bad, and you know, just look to do better at the next thing you do. And so, if you relate that to other people too, it probably will work. So these things happen on on the field, right? Yes. And people think it's only about sports. It's not. It's about life, isn't it? It's like a game. Life is a game, and you're playing to win. You're but playing some, to win, Yeah. but then something happens and you don't, and people are feeling terrible, right? Mm-hmm. And a good teammate knows how to make someone... Listen, that doesn't, make, that doesn't mean that you say, listen, it doesn't matter that you didn't do your best, because it does matter, right? It does matter. How do you get the most out of your teammates? You get the most by talking to them, you know, and saying, it's okay. Sometimes in life you fall, but then that's when you get back up and you, you get on your crying and do what you're supposed to do. So a teammate says, I'm tired, I can't do it, you say. If you're tired, then drink some coffee and wake <laughs> up. <laughs> you know? But um, when, when someone comes to you and, and they're really down, it's like in your best interest to pick them up and tell them, you know, life is a... Is, a bunch of lemonade, and in order to make... Uh, you got these lemons all around yeah, you, right? What you do you got to make? You got to make lemonade. Like, come on now. You're thirsty, drink some lemonade. You got lemons, make lemons. Someone says, come on, look at all these bad breaks we got. Look at all... Got a referee who's giving us a hard... Umpire giving us a hard time. Referee giving us a hard time. Good teammate does. Tell them to keep fighting, no matter what. You know, bad things are going to happen. You could look at that and say, okay, it's, I'm quitting now. I, nothing's going my way. Or you could tell them to keep fighting. Quitting an option? No, it's not. Why not? Talk about it. Because if you quit in something you've, you know, let's say you've barely worked for something and 
you still quit. Well, that little work you've put in is still gone to waste. So if you're doing something as a teammate, you get all the guys around you. Or, or young or, ladies, go ahead. Yes. Or young ladies do it 100% and tell them don't quit, and you'll have something really special. Say you never play, say you never play competitive sports again on the collegiate level or any level. But as a student of leadership, I'm curious about this. Like what makes a leader? Like what makes, I have to lead this organization, I make mistakes every day, screw up all the time trying to learn from them, don't always, right? But I often think that who we are as leaders comes from a lot of things that happen, happen to us growing up yes. in sports, in our families, in the neighborhood, all kinds of stuff. I'm not gonna get overly philosophical, but how much of who a leader, of the leader you think you're gonna be is a product of what's happened to you right now? It's, I think everything that's happened to me in high school and before is why I'm a leader today. You know, if I haven't seen the people in front of me, the captains in front of me do what they do, some fail to be a leader and some, you know, succeed at a very really high level, level, I wouldn't be... Um, why do you say that? Why, why do you say that? I mean, you've seen people fail to be a leader. Some people don't, um, you know, being a leader is almost helping the young kids on the teams and teaching them as well. Someone says, hey, wait, my job is to be the best I can be. Mm -hmm. Have the best statistics, score as much as I can. It's that kid's, that other kid problem. That's his problem, what he does. You say? No, it's everyone's problem if he's not doing what he needs to do too. Is it? It is. Is that what a great leader does, picks up everybody else? Sometimes you have to let them pick up themselves in order to learn from what they have, the mistake that they have made. Really? Yeah. So it's interesting, both of you strong leaders have a different view. So you're saying a good leader sometimes has to let some folks fail, it fall will, down. Yes. And you say, don't let them fail. Yeah. Well, if, when you see them failing, you pick them up. You see okay. it happening. Yes, it's happened. You say it's not an option. It's I'm not, not gonna option. I'm not gonna let you fail. Yes. That's interesting. That it's, it's also proving that leadership is not a science. It's it's an art. There's no one way to do it. Yeah. Um, before I let you out of here, what kind of reaction have you gotten from the people around you when you won this award? What'd you get? I got a, a lot of really good reactions, but you know, sometimes other people feel as if, you know, they deserve <laughs> some awards, you know. Oh, jealousy? But, not jealousy, but you know, some people do work hard. A lot of kids in Orange High School, they work hard for what, you know, they want. And you know, sometimes it comes down to a decision where it's yes or no, and if it's this person or that person. So, you know, I feel really honored to be a part of this whole best player, you know, award because it makes me feel honored. It's a great thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of reaction did you get at home? Um, at home, I had a you know a great reaction because my parents understood um, what this award meant, and it wasn't how I played; it was how, you know, I was a friend and teammate to all the people I, you know I played with. What did you get from your teammates? Um, actually, I mean, some teammates I was with, you know, everyone congratulated me on it, but others were like, "Oh, it's you know, it's not the MVP award, <laughs> teammate. It's just your best teammate." So. You know, some were negative in ways, but a lot were positive. Yeah. One thing, you don't need a speech from me, but I'll tell you what, one thing about being a leader, Colin Powell, General you know who that is, right? Yes. He said one time, sometimes being a leader means you're not gonna be popular, meaning you're gonna do the right thing and other people are gonna decide for themselves about you. Mm -hmm. yeah. But both of you are gonna be strong leaders. I know and I can feel it. <laughs> and uh, that's why you won the Best Teammate Award. Of uh, 37 other people who won it uh, with the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center, Best Teammate Award with our friends at Investors Bank. Luke and Melissa, congratulations, all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Normally we're one-on-one. -on -one. In this case, we're going one-on-two -on -two for good reason. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. That's great. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. To see more one-on-one -on -one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Truly innovative leaders in the healthcare industry today are looking at partnerships as a way to expand their reach within the communities that they serve. Welcome back to Life and Living, I'm Joanna Gagas. Virtua and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia are doing exactly that partnering together to bring critical pediatric services that were previously unavailable 
right here to the community in South Jersey. I'm here with Stephanie Fendrick, who is the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Program Development here at Virtua. Stephanie played an integral role in bringing together the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia with Virtua. Stephanie, why did Virtua see the value in partnering with CHOP? Well, in 2010, Virtua was looking for a partner to help meet the needs for our pediatric hospital-based services. As we thought about the vision for what we wanted to provide for our community, CHOP had a very similar vision for South Jersey and was very interested in working with us to help grow services for the residents and the children in this community. And we now have a pediatric joint venture for sleep services. We have a pediatric imaging center as well as the pediatric sedation unit. We've done a pilot with CHOP around telemedicine and we continue to work with CHOP to look at what types of specialists we need to support the patients here and how we might be able to bring more of those specialists into our community. We have always gone back to the tenet of we want to provide the right level of care at the right place at the right time. I'm here with Dr. Asif Khwaja, who's the Medical Director of Pediatric Imaging with CHOP at Virtua. Now, what is pediatric imaging used for? So pediatric imaging is a subspecialty of radiology, and so that encompasses every type of imaging study that can be formed on children, so x-rays, CAT scans, MRIs. And the reason we have pediatric imaging is that kids are different than adults. They have specific needs and requirements, and the diseases that a child can get are different than the disease that an adult can get. So that's why we have pediatric imaging specialists. You also have child life specialists. I know that they play a very important role in the screening process. Explain what they do. So the child life specialist uh, is somebody who, again, has special training to deal with children. And what they do is help the child feel as comfortable um, as possible when they're getting an imaging study done so that the study can be done in a safe and uh, efficient manner. So they'll use a variety of techniques. Uh, the most important ones are distraction type techniques. So if a kid is having an IV inserted that may be needed for um, a CAT scan or MRI, they'll sit there and read a book with them or show them a game on an iPad or blow bubbles with them. We're standing here in front of a mock MRI machine. Why is it important to have a, a mock MRI machine where a child can go through the process before it's, it's real? Well, MRI is a very long test, sometimes an hour, an hour and a half long. And so that's a long time for a child to sit still. And when you get in there too, it's a very loud test. And what we like to do is take away the unexpected um, parts of the test for the children. So they come in here and they're able to go through the motions and experience what it would be like to have that imaging study done. And so when they get in there in the real scanner, they're not surprised or get scared by any of the things that they experience. I'm here with Dr. Jeffrey Seiden, who is the Associate Medical Director for the CHOP at Virtua Pediatric Emergency Department. You are the physician liaison for CHOP and Virtua. Explain your role and, and what that means. Well, a lot of what I do really has to do with uh, making sure that the two institutions are working together towards their common mission. Uh, and I think mostly that involves providing the most appropriate care for children in the pediatric emergency department, as well as the other pediatric services that we offer. In the, in the family's own community so that they don't have to travel outside of their community in order to achieve that level of care. We're bringing the resources of a uh, very large children's hospital to really uh, a local community hospital. So um, things like wait times uh, and, and the speed with which we're able to provide care here is very different than what you can get in a very busy urban emergency department. Why is it important that we have a separate pediatric emergency department than the main emergency department? We think it actually contributes to healing an appropriate level of care. So there's not the stresses of the adult emergency department surrounding them. When families come in, they're greeted by a very family-friendly waiting room and a whole host of staff who are specially trained to deal only with children, which I think makes a real big difference. Here we have pediatric emergency medicine physicians. Why is that important? The extra training that's involved in becoming a pediatric emergency medicine physician really involves um, seeing many, many uh, acutely ill or injured children and being able to provide a level of care uh, maybe without the same degree of testing and unnecessary intervention that you might see being provided by those who are not specially trained to deal with children. How 
has the relationship with CHOP supported the services that you're able to offer? The CHOP at Virtual Partnership provides us with uh, subspecialty support and resources that enable the clinician team to do procedures and treatment right here at Virtua. That way, um, we are able to care for the babies uh, in the community and keep the families uh, right in the community as well. If we are able to provide the baby's care right here uh, at Virtua and in the community, there is less hardship that is imposed on the family. There are other ways that you try to support the families through this emotional time, and, and one of those ways is the Ronald McDonald rooms. What is the purpose of those rooms? The Ronald McDonald room is a place for the families to get away from the intensity of the environment where the baby is, and they are able to have some time for relaxation and refreshment. We find that when they leave and come back to, to the intensive care room, um, they are more refreshed, uh, they are more relaxed, and they're able to relate to their babies in a different way. There are also nesting rooms, which help parents transition out of the hospital setting. Why is that transition process important before they go home? The nesting room is uh, meant to be a, a launching pad, if you will, for babies who are ready to go home. It simulates the home environment for the families, and uh, we find that uh, this experience uh, helps to bolster their confidence in caring for the baby I'm here with Dr. Samir Doshi, who is the medical director in the Pediatric Pavilion in Memorial Hospital in Mount Holly. Now there's a really innovative model here with the emergency care and the inpatient care. Explain that for us. About a year ago, we opened uh, what we um, called the Pediatric Pavilion, which is a hybrid unit. It's a uh, combined emergency and inpatient unit in which we can care for um, all kids under 18 years of age. How is this shared model actually improving the continuum of care for the patients mm -hmm. that you serve? We have the same staff, both physicians, nurses, techs, um, child life, um, that all will take care of you from start to finish. If you come into our emergency side and you need to be admitted and, you and you're transferred over to the inpatient side, it's the same group of docs, nurses, and other staff will be taking care of you, and so they get to know the patients really well. This provides for less medical errors, as well as a, a better relationship between the hospital staff and the patients. Do you find that this is also driving down the cost of mm -hmm. healthcare? Um, it certainly does. As I said, you know, the, the shared model not only uh, includes uh, the staffing resources, um, but uh, it also uh, is with other resources such as medications and all the supplies that we need. And so, um, you know, in kind of being able to dynamically move, uh, you know, the resources on either side, it definitely costs less overall to, to take care of the pediatric patients here. There are some other innovative partnership applications of, of the partnership with CHOP and Virtua. Telemedicine mm -hmm. is one of them. Tell us about sure. it. Sure. Um, yeah, so actually Virtua is the, um, is the pilot site for uh, the CHOP uh, telemedicine program. And with this telemedicine robot, we actually have access to certain CHOP subspecialists. Um, for example, we have access to uh, CHOP neurology. And so um, without the neurologist having to actually come on site, we can wheel this robot into a patient room and, and through the computer um, we can actually have an interaction between the pediatric neurologist and a family in real time. Um, not only can the families talk um, to the neurologist, but actually the neurologist can see the examination uh, you know, through the robot. They can actually hear heart sounds through a stethoscope. They can see the neurologic exam pupillary responses uh, as well. And so it's actually kind of a, a full consultation um, done remotely. Families should get the best possible care in their own community. For many of our families, it's a hardship to go into Philadelphia, and so providing some of these services here makes it much easier for them. To see more one on one programs, visit us online at oneonone.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at infocaucusnj.org. At Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Steve Adubato here on the campus of the New Jersey Institute of Technology. We've just finished a, a really exciting forum uh, on the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, talking about uh, the final days before the first enrollment period to sign up for the exchange 
It's so important. I'll tell you what, a lot of interesting comments back and forth by a group of experts, and uh, Wendy Sykes is one of them, director of the Orange ACA Navigator Project. We also had folks in the audience who asked some great questions as well. Wendy, let me ask you, what do you take away from a discussion like this where so many people had questions and wanted to understand more about the exchanges in the ACA? What do you take away from it? That the information is very important. It's still important to um, get out there, do community events. There are still a lot of questions. There are No matter how many events we seem to do, we come across individuals with the same uh, types of questions. Like what? Um, like the questions that some of the students here had, you know, um, it, you know, should I, I have health insurance uh, or I'm losing my job? Uh, where do I go to get health insurance? Um, just different things like that. And then we had questions about um, how long can I stay on my parents' plan? Um, you, um, you know, and just the Affordable Health Care Act law in general. But here's the other thing you said. You know, Wendy was saying as part of the panel that sometimes people come into her place and ask questions about, hey, I'm not a citizen. Am I eligible for the ACA on the... Uh, uh, can I enroll under the exchange? Um, I'm, um, how about this? I serve time in prison. All kinds of other questions. Talk to me about that. Those are questions people want to know about. And, those, and by the way, what are the answers? And those are our different populations that we deal with on, on, at the grassroots level. These are individuals that are not used to having health insurance. And so, um, you know, these are individuals that have, the, they have a right to have those type of questions. They're not sure about what, what the law says. Does that mean sometimes they avoid even coming in because they don't know and don't want to even talk to anyone potentially connected to the government? And that's the reason why we have food that usually draws people in because we need to get them in so that we know what are your questions, what is your situation, and how can we help you navigate through that situation to a point to where you're covered somehow, either on um, with the NJ Family Cares or through the marketplace with the quality health care plan. So interesting. You know, we were talking about the fact that as of right now when we do this program, about 74, 75,000 people in New Jersey of the 350,000 who are eligible under the Affordable Care Act to sign up for the exchanges have actually done it. That's about a quarter, my math, maybe less than that. Disappointed by that? The numbers, you know, a little bit. Um, but you have to realize that the, we knew that the work was going to be great. And we knew that we had a challenge up, up there. We're proud about the numbers that we actually achieved. Um, but, we, but being on the, on, you know, on the grassroots level, we know that there are so many pe more people out there that need insurance. And so the communication, just getting them to understand that, listen, it's available to you. Come and get it. Um, ask the questions that you need. And, and we talked about another factor, which was trust. And yeah, so talk that, about that trust. That was a whole theme tonight. Mm -hmm. That's why you need face-to-face -face communication, just like I'm talking to you right here. Um, individuals that can identify with someone that looks like them, sound like them, talk like them, they're more willing to trust you and trust the information that you're giving them and, and not think that they're going to be um, caught up in, in some type of a, a scam, number one, or misinformation. Language a barrier, too? Or an obstacle or challenge? Language, most of the time, is an obstacle and a challenge, but that's something that we did foresee. And at the Orange's ACA Navigator Project, we have individuals that can communicate with um, our consumers in, our, in the areas that we deal with um, in their own language. In addition to that, you know, we didn't talk about the healthcare.gov website. But, you know, if you're computer savvy, you can actually go on the website yourself and start your application before March the 31st. But let me ask you this, we're doing this and it'll be seen after March 31st, but we have folks who are right there, and we'll get some shots later of this, in the back of the room who are experts who are helping folks navigate, as we speak right now, that website, going through it. For a lot of folks, it is overwhelming, that healthcare.gov website. You can understand that, right? Absolutely, especially if you're not a t you know, tech savvy, um, it, it can be overwhelming just going on the computer to check your email. I mean, uh, so so like like I said before, we're here to do face-to-face -face assistance. For those that are tech savvy, you can get on the website and at least start your application before the deadline. You may not get through the entire process. You may have to wait for eligibility, but at least you're registered as having applied before the deadline. Let's talk about after the deadline. Again, being seen after March 31st on public television. Let's talk about the fact that there are some areas that if you fall into these, I don't know whether we call them hardships or certain special circumstances, even if you've missed the March 31st deadline, under certain circumstances, you still have the opportunity to try to enroll under the exchanges connected to the exchange connected to the ACA. Describe that. 
Right, those are extenuating circumstances and so such as and so I was just gonna give examples. If you have if you get married, you know, if you have a family addition to your family, um, if you lose your job, or if you become a citizen. Um, under these circumstances, you can apply for some type of quality health care plan through the marketplace exchange after the open enrollment period. And people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people do not know that. So, you know, this is the type of information that we are really trying to get out to them. One more thing before I let you go. Medicaid expansion keeps going, right? Medicaid expansion does not end. It's a rolling um, enrollment uh, process. And so we can do it all year long. There is no deadline. That does not... You know, that's not in conjunction with the um, open enrollment deadline. Wendy, let me ask you this. What would you say the biggest lesson we've learned from this first effort to enroll people under the ACA has been from your perspective? Because you're on the front lines. Biggest lessons. Well, you know, in the beginning there were glitches. And so we were trying to just get through that hurdle. Um, but, in its, but after that, you know, once the marketplace started rolling, um, the biggest lesson is just to um, remain open and remain there for follow-up for individuals because... It's not over once you pick a plan. It's not over once you um, are deemed eligible by the marketplace. And so you still will need somewhere to go to do the follow-up to say, listen, I have my card. Where do I go? What do I do? Because, again, these individuals, you know, our population is not used to having health insurance, a lot of them. And so once they get a health insurance card, you kind of have to guide them through. What do you do with it? How do I pick my doctor? We at OACA and P, Orange's ACA Navigator Project, um, will do that. We'll assist you with with some type of um, you know guidance. You can't just walk away. No. You can't say, "Hey, we're done. You already signed up. I'm out of here." Right. Um, we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that there's a connection, that they're actually using the plan that they pick, and that the plan works for them. So that maybe you know, if it doesn't, maybe the the next open enrollment period they can change you know, um, insurances or whatever they need to do. But we, we want to be there, and we are there for individuals that need that follow-up. And remind folks one more time, the next open enrollment period is? Next open, open enrollment period for the marketplace begins November 15, 2014, through February 15, 2015. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, Investors Bank, Choose New Jersey, NJIT, Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, PSE&G, committed to improving New Jersey's economy and strengthening its communities. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. I will. It's the oath of those strong in character. A call to build our own dreams, not someone else's. Doing whatever it takes to create a better way. This is Health Republic, a not-for-profit co-op health plan created to give us control of our own health care. So we all have the support we need when it's time to say, I will. Health Republic. Live independently healthy.